I have no financial conflicts of interest to disclose. I am supported in part by this department and also through a grant by the NIH. I just want to orient you to the slides a little bit. So in the upper right hand corner for all the slides you'll see a series of numbers and digits and um, that look like an outline um, citation. And then on the bottom left, you'll see also the text describing what exactly we're talking about. So that for those of you who are keeping score at home, um, by the end of this, you'll see that I will have covered everything in this first part of OB um, that is expected of you as in, the out, in the content outline that has been provided by the ABA. And also, I just wanted to let you know that since this uh, is modern technology and you have the luxury of being able to stop and slow down and fast forward as you please, occasionally throughout the talk, uh, due to the time constraints that I have today, um, I may just have you, I might say something like, please pause here and see uh, this slide, make sure you understand the concept before moving on. So let's get right into it, the physiologic changes of pregnancy. Pregnancy alters all of the physiology, uh, all of the organ systems, the physiology of all organ systems. So cardiovascular, pulmonary, hematologic, renal, you name it, it's affected. Um, let's start with cardio, uh, cardiovascular changes. Cardiac output is increased in pregnancy, mostly by virtue of an increase in stroke volume by 30%. There is an increase in heart rate as well, but usually only by 15%. This increase is up to 45% at term, and then when onset of labor occurs, it goes up by an additional 30%. The most significant increase in cardiac output occurs immediately after the placenta is delivered, so the third stage of labor, where it goes up by up to 80%. This is partially due to the autotransfusion that occurs with uterine involution. Systemic vascular resistance also decreases, and this is primarily due to an effect of progesterone, but also due to uh, the low resistance placental vascular bed, and also the fact that pregnancy reduces blood viscosity, as we'll discuss in a future um, slide. There's also this concept of aortic cable compression or supine hypotension syndrome. This should not be um, unfamiliar to you at all, but here's the concept in general. On the figure on the left, you see that a woman who's at full term will have a compression of both the aorta and the IVC when she's in complete supine position. And that will, uterine, um, that will compromise both uterine perfusion as well as preload. But that all translates to a decrease in cardiac output and a decrease in blood pressure. And this can lead to symptoms in some women. Um, you can see on the figure on the right that by uterine displacement, either by tilt or wedge, um, or by having the woman go full on a lateral position, can relieve almost completely these, um, these uh, compressions to the aorta and the IVC. Now, this can happen at uh, any time the uterus exits the pelvis during gestation, and usually this is about 20 weeks of gestational age that people will say that you should begin to start worrying about this, sy this syndrome. Now, how much tilt do you need to do in order to prevent that from happening? By convention, historically, in all the textbooks you'll read, 15 degrees at the very least. But there are some very interesting uh, results from a recent study, an MRI study done by Higuchi and colleagues, that compared uh, various tilts and angles um, uh, to in women who are pregnant and who are unpregnant in various angles, so 15, 30, and 45 degrees, and they showed that really there is no relief by MRI um, demonstration of this aortic cable compression until the woman was at at least 45 degrees, or at least 30 degrees of, uh, of tilt. And what this may mean is um, that the tilt that we do may not be enough, or potentially that it may not make a difference because none of the women in any of these groups had any symptoms at all associated with uh, the supine position. So while these are very interesting findings, it just um, it is also important to note that this particular study was done in non-anesthetized women, so women who hadn't had a subarachnoid block, for example. And so this just is a further, um, further uh, indication that we probably need to study this a little bit more before we make good recommendations on how much tilt needs to happen in the context of neuraxial analgesia or anesthesia for cesarean delivery. So uteroplacental perfusion and ox fetal oxygenation is determined by this relationship, um, which you should be fairly familiar with based on your knowledge of neurophysiology. But in general, uterine blood flow is directly proportional to the difference between uterine arterial pressure and uterine venous pressure, and all of that divided by the uterine vascular resistance. So that uh, decreased uterine blood flow can, be, uh, can happen as a result of maternal hypotension, uh, positive pressure ventilation, and maternal hypocarbia. There also can be decreases in uterine blood flow due to increases in uterine vascular resistance, the denominator of this relationship. 
so that a woman who has increased levels of circulating catecholamines, for example, when she's in a lot of pain during labor, or if she's highly anxious before any type of surgery, or highly anxious at all times, just uh, by virtue of her personality, this can cause um, decreases in uterine blood flow, which can lead to decreases in fetal oxygenation. Also, high doses of alpha agonists. Now, again, high doses meaning um, above and beyond or overdose of what we might give, say, for example, as prophylaxis after a spinal anesthetic. An increased uterine tone can also change uterine vascular resistance in an unfavorable, unfavorable way uh, for uterine blood flow. There are pulmonary changes as well, so that uh, by term pregnancy, FRC goes down by 20%, and ERV and residual volume go down by 25% and 15% respectively. At the same time, um, inspiratory capacity goes up by 15%, and IRV and tidal volume also go up by 5% and 45% respectively. So that this translates basically to no change in your vital capacity during term pregnancy at all. Um, Minute, ven minute ventilation does go up by 50% as well as tidal volume, respiratory rate um, as well. And tidal volume is the primary component uh, at an increase of 40% is the primary component by which minute ventilation goes up during pregnancy. All of this translates to a decrease in arterial CO2 down to about 30 millimeters of mercury and uh, bicarb um, compensatory compensatorily will decrease to about 20 milli equivalents per liter. There's also high oxygen consumption associated with the pregnant state and also the laboring state, as we'll discuss in a second. So during labor, minute ventilation goes up significantly, up to 140% by the end of the first stage of labor. And by the second stage of labor, this is um, up to almost 200%. This is in an unmedicated woman. Um, this is all also um, changed by a woman who's in pain, who has anxiety, and who maybe is coaching her breathing by herself or somebody else. The PaCO2 can drop as low as 10 to 15 millimeters per, of mercury during labor, and O2 consumption is further increased from the baseline pregnant state. In the first stage, it goes up by 40%, and by the second stage, it's up by 75%. Now, um, when you do uh, neuraxial analgesia, this can prevent these changes almost completely during the first stage of labor, and uh, the neuraxial analgesia can mitigate any of these changes uh, during the second stage of labor. Uh, there are additional airway changes that go on as well. So progesterone um, induces direct bronchodilation by smooth muscle effect, and progesterone also has an indirect bronchodilating effect by enhancing beta-2 activity. Um, airway edema is also very common, especially term pregnancy, and so for this reason, if a general anesthetic is necessary, smaller endotracheal tubes are necessary, sometime, somewhere in the range of six and a half or seven um, millimeters in diameter. There's significant capillary engorgement, which makes it um, easy to bloody the oral and nas nasopharynx during any type of um, airway manipulation. And for this reason, it's very important to avoid any type of nasal instrumentation um, during pregnancy. So this would mean no blind nasal intubations, for example, and uh, no nasal temperature probes or nasogastric tubes, et cetera. The other thing about uh, pulmonary and airway changes during pregnancy is that it changes dramatically during labor as well. So this figure shows um, a woman who is not preeclamptic, a normal healthy woman who has gone through labor. And uh, figure A shows her airway exam before she's gone through labor. And you can see it's a very favorable exam. Nobody would have any hesitation trying to get an endotracheal tube in the, if they needed to in that case. Now figure B shows what she, sh what she looks like after labor. Um, so all the changes that go on with Valsalva maneuvers and, and the oxytocin that can cause water retention during and after labor period can make uh, an airway exam after labor or even during labor in the later stages very unfavorable. Pregnant women are more likely to die from aspiration pneumonitis during induction and extubation from general anesthesia. And although this risk is rare and it, it's dropped significantly due to the more widespread use of neuraxial analgesic and anesthetic techniques among pregnant women. So, but as a result of this, the ASA best practice guidelines advocate for timely administration of non-particulate antacids, H2 antagonists, and or metoclopramide, particularly before um, cesarean delivery. So in summary, 
pulmonary changes um, during pregnancy encompass changes in pulmonary physiology, changes in airway anatomy, and GI changes during pregnancy and labor, and all of this results in early desaturation, difficult failed intubation, aspiration risks, and a respiratory alkalosis, where a baseline pH of a woman, if you were to just do a random ABG on her, would be about um, 7.44. So renal changes in pregnancy. Um, there is an increase in renal blood flow, which translates to an increase in GFR by um, 50%. So as a result of this, your renal lab, renal lab values will be decreased as well. So your VUN and creatinine will be down by 50%. So that in, nor in pregnancy, a normal creatinine is about 0.5 to 0.6. And this becomes important because if you're doing some kind of um, chemistry panel on, let's say, a woman for whom you're at risk or concerned about um, preeclampsia, if you got labs back that were somewhere in 0.7 or 0.8 or 0.9 range, while this may look normal on your um, chemistry lab reporting sheets, um, it is actually abnormal for pregnancy. And so this woman may be actually at risk for renal injury. So also during pregnancy, the increased estrogen levels lead to increased plasma renin activity, which leads to renal sodium absorption and water retention by the, renin, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. There are GI changes in, um, as well. There are increased um, intragastric pressure, and also there's a decrease in lower esophageal sphincter tone, primarily as a result of displacement of the stomach and also a progesterone effect. Gastric emptying time is important to know because pregnancy in and of itself does not change gastric emptying time. However, the onset of labor, which can be associated with the release of endogenous opioids and the administration of exogenous opioids will decrease your gastric emptying time. So those changes during pregnancy are the only things that will decrease your gastric emptying time. So there are hepatobiliary changes as well. Bilirubin, ALT, AST, and LDH are all within the upper limits of normal range at term pregnancy. ALK-FOS activity is increased by, uh, by a factor of two, and part of this is due to an increase in placental production. Biliary stasis is a significant risk of increase during pregnancy by a couple of mechanisms. One, gallbladder hypomotility from progesterone. There's also an increase in secretion of bile and cholesterol um, during pregnancy. And as a result of this, uh, pregnant women in general have an incidence of gallstones between 5 and 12 percent. And there's also an incidence of cholecystectomy in, pregnant, in the pregnant population of 1 in 1,600 to 10,000. Um, so, so this is actually one of the most common non-obstetric surgeries during pregnancy to be performed. To be performed. Plasma volume um, at term pregnancy is up by 55%. RBC volume increases due to elevated erythropoietin concentration, and also there are erythropoietic effects from progesterone, prolactin, and human placental lactogen. So this relative hypervolemia assists with delivery of nutrients to the fetus and protects against hypotension and reduces the risks associated with hemorrhage at delivery. And what this also means is that women who have a postpartum hemorrhage may look hemodynamically compensated for several hours before they, before they finally fall off a cliff and can no longer compensate. Now this makes it very important um, to do accurate estimations of blood loss during any vaginal or, or cesarean delivery, and good team communication is also an important process of, the, of this as well. The decrease in blood viscosity that occurs during pregnancy creates a decreased resistance to blood flow, which maintains patency of the uteroplacental vascular bed as well. So here are the blood volume changes associated with pregnancy and the postpartum period. The star here um, indicates that RBC volume is below the pre-pregnancy volume at the end of the first trimester. So blood volume at term gestation is overall increased by 45% compared to baseline. Pregnancy repre represents a hypercoagulable state, in part by virtue of clotting system activation. So fibrinogen is increased and normal fibrinogen levels are between 300 and 500 milligrams per deciliter during term pregnancy. And this is important because if you were to detect an early decrease in fibrinogen levels in cases of obstetric hemorrhage, this has been traditionally associated with cases of severe hemorrhage requiring massive transfusion. Also, PT and PTT are shortened, antithrombin-3 is decreased, and fibrinopeptide A is increased. 
Thus, pregnant women are at risk for thromboembolism. Here are the results of a TAG study that um, looked at group one, or the solid line, which was non-pregnant women, group two, which was pregnant term but not laboring, and then group three, which is a pregnant group who was laboring. And as you can see, there's a progressive decrease in the R and K values, an increase in the alpha angle, and an increase in the maximum amplitude. There's also a decrease in lysis, though you can't really see that in this figure. And these changes can begin as early as 10 to 12 weeks of gestational age. Pregnancy represents a state of accelerated but compensated intravascular coagulation. So here's a table that summarizes the changes in coagulation and fibrinolytic parameters at term gestation. You can pause the recording here to make sure that you um, understand and have um, gotten these factor changes. But in general, pregnancy is associated with an, in, an enhanced platelet turnover, clotting, and fibrinolysis. Um, increases in platelet factor four and beta thrombo thromboglobulin signal an elevated platelet activation. And the progressive increase in platelet distribution width and platelet volume are also consistent with um, an elevation in platelet consumption during pregnancy. So also, uh, platelet aggregation increases in response to collagen, epinephrine, ADP, and arachidonic acid. There's a greater concentration of fibrin degradation products and plasminogen, which signals increased fibrinolytic activity during gestation. Despite all these changes, bleeding time is unchanged, which suggests that maybe increased platelet production compensates for greater activation. Normally, platelet count decreases during the third trimester in order uh, or due to an increased destruction of hemodilution and hemodilution. So that 8% of women will have a platelet count of less than 150 in their third trimester, while 0.9% will have a count of less than 100. And some common etiologies for these are, uh, these changes are one, gestational thrombocytopenia, which is basically an exaggerated normal response of platelet destruction and hemodilution. Two, hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, and three, idiopathic thrombocytopenia. So here are the various changes that occur with plasma proteins. The most notable thing to remember here is that the albumin to globulin ratio decreases from the non-pregnant state as pregnancy progresses. There are significant musculoskeletal changes that occur as pregnancy progresses. So on the figure on the left, figure A shows normal posture, normal lumbar uh, segments during non-pregnant state. And figure B will show, is showing the increased lumbar low dose, lower doses that is associated with pregnancy. And you can see as a result of this, there is a significant change in interspinous spaces so that there is uh, quite a nice opening for you in the non-pregnant state for you to be able to try neuraxial anesthetic um, versus in the pregnant state where these spaces narrow significantly and may make neuraxial um, anesthesia a little bit more challenging. The hips widen during pregnancy as well so that if you were to try any of these techniques in the lateral position, you have to compensate or account for the fact that there is an increase in cephalocaudad um, angle associated with the widening of the pelvis and the hips during pregnancy. So here's just another figure that shows just how pronounced the um, the uh, postural changes of pregnancy can be so that by 12 weeks, really not much is shown, but by 36 weeks, um, a woman's height can be even somewhat decreased. The kyphosis is much more pronounced and the lordosis is much more pronounced as well so that your uh, request to have a mother flex her spine for your attempt at neuraxial anesthesia may be met with a, the best effort she can possibly give you but still may not change much of her posture due to the fact that she has a bowling ball in front of her belly. So. There are also neurologic changes um, of pregnancy as well. There are spinal doses, um, or the spinal doses rather, are decreased um, by 25% at term gestation. There are a number of reasons for this. One, your CSF volume is decreased due to venous um, plexus fat and fat distension. There's also an increased sensitivity to local anesthetics. Um, we saw on the slide before that there's a higher apex of the thoracic kyphosis, which means that with hyperbaric solutions um, for spinal anesthesia, for example, the pooling of the medication will occur at a higher level already. And then um, your increased abdominal pressure will result in an inward displacement of intervertebral foramenal soft tissue as well. Um, CSF pressure is really not changed during pregnancy except when a woman is contracting and pushing. 
and CSF volume in general has, is decreased during pregnancy as well, as we just mentioned. So MAC is decreased by 40%, but this may not necessarily mean that pregnant patients have a decreased requirement for inhaled anesthetics. There was one study that compared 15 pregnant and 15 non-pregnant women undergoing general anesthesia, and they found really no difference in bispectral index values between groups for whatever BIS values are worth. But nevertheless, more research is necessary to confirm these findings. The FA to FI ratio is increased in pregnancy, which means that there is a faster induction um, of anesthesia due to greater minute ventilation and also decreased FRC. Pregnant women also have different responses to non-depolarizing muscle relaxants, so that there is an increased sensitivity to aminosteroids, and also there is an associated decrease in pseudocolon esterase activity. Um, and while this may be um, interesting, it really doesn't lead to any clinically significant changes or effects on succinylcholine. Um, and pseudocholinesterase activity returns to normal by six weeks postpartum. But what this does mean if, is if there is some kind of suspicion um, and testing is necessary based on family history or personal history, pregnancy is probably not the best time to do this, these types of testing since uh, regardless if they're normal, they will look abnormal on the panel and per perhaps it's better to do it before she gets pregnant or six weeks after she has delivered. Um, intravenous anesthetic consideration. So remember, volume of distribution is increased in pregnancy and this affects your drug dosing. Propofol requirements are decreased by 10% in the first trimester, but this does not appear to be correlated with progesterone levels, and rather it is much more likely to be a function of increased clearance, while elimination half-life is unchanged. Thiopental is really rarely ever used anymore, but sometimes it still shows up on exams. The induction dose of thiopental is decreased by 35% at term, and its clearance is increased as well as its elimination half-life. There are uh, considerations for chronotropic agents and vasopressors. Now again, the volume of distribution is increased. Um, also, beta receptors are down-regulated so that for drugs like isoproteranol and epinephrine, these have decreased chronotropic responses, chronotropic responses, and so this may mean that they are less sensitive indicators of intravascular injection during test dose compared to the non-pregnant state. Vasopressor dosing is also changed uh, due to downregulation of beta receptors as well, so that you need higher doses of vasopressors in pregnancy in order to achieve the same effect. So maternal pharmacokinetics. Bioavailability, bioavailability is unchanged in pregnancy, um, but protein binding has changes, so that there is a decrease in plasma albumin by 70% of normal. There is no real change in alpha-1 acid glycoprotein, but there is an increase in free fatty acids, and all of this de um, translates to a decrease in protein binding in general, which means that there is an increase in free drug concentration. The exception to all of this is uh, a woman who has chronic administration of any drug, which can offset this by increasing the uh, clearance of the free drug. So uh, most drugs are metabolized by the liver. Um, the rate of metabolism depends on flow rate and enzyme activity. And although cardiac output is increased during pregnancy, it's really not clear if this increase in cardiac output translates to an increase in blood flow to the liver also. Um, this is based on some studies using ultrasound and clearance of markers. Um, on the other hand, some P450 enzymes and UGT enzymes are increased and some are decreased during pregnancy. So for example, these drugs, midazolam, phenytoin, and morphine, are associated with an increased metabolism due to upregulations of these particular CYP and UGT enzymes. Um, whereas caffeine and theophylline are associated with a decreased metabolism due to downregulation of these particular CYP enzymes. So maternal pharmacokinetics um, also consists of elimination, and we know that renal blood flow is increased and renal excretion is increased, so this increases el elimination in general. Um, and what this also may mean is that it, we, uh, we may need to change our doses by increasing doses of drugs that are excreted unchanged by the kidney, so for example, cephalosporins. Um, there is also an increase in renal P glycoprotein which increases clearance of drugs like digoxin. So in summary, for anesthetic considerations in the pregnant woman, positioning is very important, not only in terms of uh, left uterine displacement to avoid supine hypotension syndrome, but also ideal positioning for neuroaxial anesthesia given uh, the fact that best efforts are necessary um, 
to try to obtain um, as, as best spine flexion as possible. Um, there's also tolerance of, of hypovolemia associated with pregnancy, and this is important for the concerns associated with hemorrhage. Um, intubation concerns and desaturation, you have to remember, as well as the changes or um, potential theoretical changes associated with the use of sex and acolene. Uh, there are also changes in MAC and vasopressor response, and also local anesthetic dose requirements that you should keep in mind. So let's switch gears and talk about the physiology of labor. So we've sort of talked about the changes associated with um, the cardiovascular and respiratory system as it occurs during labor, but there are also additional considerations for thermoregulation and metabolism. So surprisingly, ep epidural analgesia increases the risk of maternal fever in a, during labor in a very small subset of women. This mechanism is really unclear, but most likely it is non-infectious, inflammatory in nature. And it's unclear whether epidural anesthesia-associated fever places the fetus at risk for neurologic injury in the same way that infectious maternal fever is known to place the fetus at risk for neurologic injury. However, no study so far has directly linked maternal fever associated with epidural analgesia to adverse effects on the fetus or the neonate. On the other hand, epidural fever may prompt neonatal, uh, neonatologists to evaluate the neonates for possible sepsis, and this may or may not create some risk to the, fe to the neonate. So here are results from a study that looked at mean to panic temperatures during labor in three groups of patients. The open circles are epidural bup bupivacaine plus fentanyl, the X's are epidural bupivacaine only, and the blue squares are parenteral opioids. The stars indicate that um, there was a significantly lower temperature for the IV opioid group, where P was less than 0.01, compared to the epidural group. Um, and here, the differences uh, in temperature reach a level of significance where P is less than 0.01, compared to the pre-epidural analgesic temperature. During labor, O2 consumption increases due to the metabolic, the metabolic demands of hyperventilation, uterine activity, and also maternal expulsive efforts. The maternal um, aerobic oxygen requirement exceeds oxygen consumption during labor, as evidenced by the progressive um, evaluation of serum lactate concentration, which is an, in an index of anaerobic metabolism. So let's move on to the placenta. Maternal spiral arteries are maximally dilated during pregnancy, which leads to a low resistance pathway for the delivery of blood to the placenta. This blood flows through these terminal villi um, from the maternal spiral arteries into the intervillous space. The intervillous space of the mature placenta can accommodate approximately 350 cc's of maternal blood. With each maternal pulse, uh, blood flows through this intervillous space into the terminal villus, which contains vessels that interface with fetal circulation. Here, blood flows um, into the fetal venous vessels, forming chorionic veins. The single umbilical vein is a coalescence of chorionic veins that come from each villus tree. One vein delivers blood to the fetus, and two arteries return blood from the fetus back to the placenta where exchange occurs within the terminal villi as it did before. 16% of uterine blood flow is shunted through the placenta, and the fetus requires 8 cc's of O2 per kilo per minute of fetal body weight versus adults who require 3 to 4 cc's of O2 per kilo per minute. The placenta has one-fifth the O2 transfer efficiency of the adult lung and it has a lower diffusion capacity versus the adult lung. Part of this is due to the smaller surface area and thicker membrane of the placenta. So O2 transfer depends on membrane surface area, membrane thickness, O2 partial pressure gradient, affinity of maternal and fetal hemoglobin, and relative maternal and fetal blood flow. This figure shows you the concurrent relationship between the maternal and fetal circulations within the placenta and the way that this arrangement affects gas transfer. So this may be another good time for you to pause to familiarize yourself with the umbilical and uterine vessel gas values, which sometimes show up on the exams. So with a maternal FiO2 of 1, the maternal PaO2 is 435 um, millimeters of mercury. 
but fetal umbilical venous PO2 is only 47, which indicates a low diffusion capacity of O2 across the placental intervillous membrane. Furthermore, the placenta receives less than 50% of fetal cardiac output, and blood coming from the placenta admixes with deoxygenated blood in the fetal IVC, thus further limiting fetal PaO2. Despite this, O2 delivery to the fetus is flow limited and not diffusion limited. Therefore, um, maternal delivery of blood and thus oxygen to the uterus is the predominant factor that controls fetal O2 transfer. And that blood delivery is dictated by uterine blood flow. Fetal um, hemoglobin concentration is high at 17 milligrams per deciliter, and it accounts for the large O2 content and net delivery of large quantities of O2 to the fetus. Fetal hemoglobin also has a higher affinity for O2, and therefore a lower P50 than maternal hemoglobin, which then produces a sink effect that enhances O2 uptake. The Bohr effect also augments the transfer of O2 across the placenta. With the Bohr effect, fetal maternal transfer of CO2 makes maternal blood more acidic and fetal blood more alkalotic. And this pH change further causes shifts in maternal and fetal oxyhemoglobin dissociation curves, thus further enhancing the maternal O2 transfer to the fetus in what is sometimes called the double Bohr effect. And this double Bohr effect accounts for 2 to 8% of trans transplacental transfer of O2. So transfer of CO2 occurs through different forms. There's dissolved uh, CO2, carbonic acid, bicarbonate ion, carbonate ion, and carbaminohemoglobin. The PCO2 gradient drives fetal maternal transfer of CO2. The rapid movement of CO2 from fetal capillary to maternal blood invokes a shift in the equilibrium of the carbonic anhydrase reaction that produces more CO2 for diffusion. This is otherwise known as Le Chatelier's principle. The transfer of CO2 is further augmented by production of deoxyhemoglobin in the maternal blood, which has a high affinity for CO2 than hemoglobin. This is otherwise known as the Haldane effect, and this affinity may account for as much as 46% of the transplacental transfer of CO2. Now, the placenta is an imperfect barrier. It allows many substances to cross from maternal to fetal circulation and vice versa. A vast array of cytochrome P450 enzymes and transporters are found within the placenta. Some are inducible and some are constitutive. Also, a number of substances undergo specific or nonspecific binding within the placental tissues, thereby minimizing fetal exposure to and accumulation of the substances. The thickness of the placental membranes, which diminishes as gestation progresses, may also influence the rate of diffusion. Fetal cells have been detected in maternal circulation and vice versa. This may occur by disruption of the trophoblastic layer or by active adhesion and transmigration, which is similar to blood-brain barrier um, migration. The presence of fetal cells in maternal circulation have been found to exert maternal immunosuppressive effects, which may explain why pregnant women sometimes develop or have worsening of autoimmune diseases, such as thyroiditis, lupus, and asthma. Cell-free fetal DNA has also been found in the, placenta, in the plasma of pregnant women, which has facilitated the development and testing for fetal sex, fetal rhesus D, blood group, fetal chromosomal aneuploidies, and other genetic abnormalities. Placental drug transfer involves all physiologic transport mechanisms that occur in other organisms, so passive and active transport, facilitated transport, and penocytosis. There are also other factors at play, maternal and fetal blood flow, placental binding, placental metabolism, diffusion capacity, maternal and fetal, maternal fetal plasma protein binding, the gestational age, as we mentioned, it's more permeable during early pregnancy, and there are other uh, factors as well, lipid solubility, pH gradients, ion trapping, and disease states like, like preeclampsia. So here's an easier way to think about it. Factors affecting drug, drug transfer across the human placenta include lipid solubility, protein binding, tissue binding, pKa, pH, and blood flow. Lipophilicity heightens drug transfer across the placenta but the placenta itself may take up highly lipophilic drugs, thereby creating a placental drug depot that limits the initial drug transfer.
The pH relative to the pKa determines the amount of drug that is ionized and unionized in both maternal and fetal, tra and fetal plasma. Fetal acidemia enhances the maternal to fetal transfer, or ion trapping, of basic drugs such as local anesthetics. The efflux transporter pumps substances in a fetal to maternal direction. So notice here that albumin concentration is higher in the fetus, leading to lower binding affinity and increased transfer. And alpha-1 acid, gly alpha acid glycoprotein concentration is higher in the maternal circulation compared to the fetal circulation, which leads to higher binding affinity and decreased transfer. It's important to remember that the effects of the changes in fetal pH are significant not only for local anesthetics, but also for the transfer of opioids. So this figure shows ion trapping of opioids, which is similar to that of local anesthetics. Here are some things to remember about placental uh, transfer of anesthetic drugs. Anesthetic agents, inhalation agents, uh, are associated with prolonged um, or inhalational agents. There's basically a consideration here for prolonged induction to delivery time intervals, which result in lower APGAR scores. Also, there are decrease, um, the inhalational agents will decrease uterine tone, which increases a risk for hemorrhage due to uterine atony. Nitrous oxide um, rapidly crosses the placenta, and this can cause neonatal depression and diffusion hypoxia in the neonate, where supplemental O2 may be necessary in the neonatal period. All IV induction agents cross the placenta. Propofol may have a sedative effect on the neonate. Plasma levels in the neonate depend on maternal dose and time to delivery intervals. Um, propofol is highly bound to albumin, so transfer is also affected by increased maternal blood flow and reduced protein binding. Ketamine rapidly crosses the placenta within 97 seconds. So benzodiazepines, um, diazepam is highly unionized, unionized, lipophilic, and 95% protein bound, which all gives it a high F to M ratio, close to one, within one minute of administration. And this contrasts with midazolam, which is much more polar, it reaches, and reaches an F to M ratio of only 0.76 after 20 minutes. And this decreases more rapidly compared to other benzodiazepines. Um, Aperidine will cause neonatal CNS and respiratory depression. Morphine rapidly crosses the placenta and it is hydrophilic. Fentanyl um, is high, highly lipophilic and protein bound. The placenta can act as a moderate drug depot for fentanyl. Its effects on the neonate are more pronounced than ultra short acting opioids such as remifentanyl. On the other hand, remifentanyl rapidly crosses the placenta but it has fewer neonatal adverse effects compared to fentanyl um, when administered as maternal PCA, for example. However, remifentanyl PCAs are associated with excessive maternal sedation and oxygen desaturation compared to fentanyl PCAs for a mom. Opioid agonists and antagonists are associated with few maternal, fetal, and neonatal side effects. Ephedrine rapidly crosses the placenta at 10 times and has 10 times the greater lipid solubility than phenylephrine. When you give ephedrine um, after a spinal anesthetic for a cesarean delivery, for example, it will result in lower pH and base excess, higher PCO2, higher glucose, lactate, epinephrine, and nor norepinephrine concentrations than phenylephrine. Atropine and scopolamine have placental transfer rates that correlate with their ability to cross the blood-brain barrier. And finally, antihypertensives. Now, beta blockers are associated with fetal growth restriction and neonatal bradycardia, hypoglycemia, and respiratory depression. Nitroprusside is highly lipid soluble. It crosses the placenta, and it can produce cyanide um, in the fetus. Sodium thiosulfite, which is the uh, antidote for cyanide toxicity, does not cross the placenta when given to mom, but by lowering the maternal ser serum cyanide levels, it can create a gradient to promote fetal elimination. Nitroglyc nitroglycerin, um, which is also sometimes used as a tocolytic agent, crosses the placenta in a limited fashion, but, lim but, it, it, the res but it results in minimal changes to fetal hemodynamics. Placental production of nitric oxide enhances the uterine relaxation caused by nitroglycerin. So it's easier to remember it this way for the anesthetic drugs that do not cross the placenta. 
uh, here in red you see GHDNP and a uh, mnemonic that you can use is good heavens do not penetrate and that stands for glycopyrrolate, heparin, the depolarizing muscle relaxants, non-depolarizing muscle relaxants, and phenylephrine. These are the drugs that do not penetrate the placenta. All right, moving on to amniotic fluid. Amniocentesis. This is a measurement of fetal lung maturity, um, infection, genetic analysis, or open neural tube deflex, defects. So fetal lung maturity can occur by measurements of, fetal le of, of lecithin and sphingomyelin, infection by detection of pathogenic bacteria, you can do genetic analysis, which um, uses fetal cells for karyotype or other specific genetic analysis. And then um, by, by detection of AFP and acetylcholinesterase, you can detect open neural tube defects. If you do an amniocentesis at less than 15 weeks gestation, you have a higher risk for pregnancy loss. Oligohydramnios is basically an amniotic fluid deficiency, and it can indicate um, fetal renal pathology, such as renal agenesis or obstruction fetal chromosomal abnormalities, intrauterine infections, the use of ACE inhibitors or prostaglandin inhibitors, and IUGR with placental insufficiency. Also, post dates or more than 42 weeks of gestational age is associated with an increased risk for oligohydramnios. There are complications of oligohydramnios. Um, there's cord compression, IUGR, pulmonary hypoplasia, club foot, club foot, and then Potter syndrome, which is a constellation of these symptoms of, um, um, or signs of pulmonary hypoplasia, limbo def limb deformities, um, characteristic faces, and renal agenesis. The treatment for oligo amnion infusion may be, but it um, is of questionable, ben questionable benefit and requires a specialized team to perform. Polyhydramnios is the opposite of oligohydramnios, and it occurs in about 1% of all pregnancies. It's defined as an amniotic fluid index of greater than 24 centimeters, and it can indicate botched delex hernia, which is a protrusion of the stomach into the diaphragm that impairs inadequate and impairs adequate swallowing of um, amniotic fluid. Barter syndrome, which is the overproduction of urine, anencephaly, down and Edwards syndromes are often associated with GI abnormalities. And skeletal dysplasia can impair adequate size of the chest cavity, which can further impair the fetus's ability to swallow adequate amounts of fluid. So let's move on to some maternal fetal considerations. Oxytocin is um, the first line drug for prophylaxis and treatment of uterine atony after, the, after delivery of a third trimester pregnancy. At term pregnancy, <clears throat> oxytocin receptors increase in number and affinity. Many of the side effects of um, exogenous oxytocin are directly related to the dose used, and these side effects include tachycardia, hypotension, myocardial ischemia, and even death um, due to hypovolemia, hypovolemia or other hemodynamic compromise. Oxytocin is structurally similar to vasopressin, so hyponatremia leading to seizures and coma may result when oxytocin is given in high doses with large volumes of IV fluids. Um, Preeclamptic women may be less able to tolerate high doses of oxytocin than healthy women. It has a short duration of effect and therefore it needs to be administered as an infusion. Carbitocin <clears throat> is not available in the US, but it is available in Canada and the UK and it does reduce the need for secondary uterotonics compared to oxytocin. It has a longer duration of action and you do not need to infuse it, um, you do not need to use it as an infusion. Ergot alkaloids, so this includes ergonovine and methyl ergonovine. This is indicated um, for postpartum uterine atony. You give this medication intramuscularly. You can give it through IV, but it is not recommended due to the serious side effects associated with it in the IV, um, in IV administration, namely um, vasoconstriction, hypertension, myocardial ischemia or infarction by virtue of coronary vasospasm, and even a stroke when you give it as an IV bolus. It is relatively contraindicated thus in patients who have hypertension or preeclampsia, peripheral vascular disease, or known ischemic heart disease. After you deliver it, you do need to monitor blood pressure and EKG um, tracings, and you can repeat this dose, but only after one hour um, after the first dose has been administered. Prostaglandins, 
and this would be uh, 15 methyl prostaglandin F2 alpha, are indicated as escalation therapy when high dose oxytocin is inadequate for postpartum hemorrhage. It is administered intramuscularly as well, and the side effects include fever, chills, nausea, vom vomiting, diarrhea, but most importantly, um, bronchospasm. Uh, and because of this, it's relatively contraindicated in patients with reactive airway disease or asthma, pulmonary hypertension, and hypoxemia. You can repeat the dose of these prostaglandins as well every 15 minutes up to a total dose of two milligrams. Misoprostol is a prostaglandin um, E1 analog. It is indicated for cervical ripening, induction of labor, and is also used off-label for postpartum hemorrhage. Its stability in tropical conditions make it attractive for use in low resource areas since oxytocin and ergot alkaloids require um, refrigeration. But still, IV oxytocin is more effective for postpartum hemorrhage prophylaxis than misoprostol. Um, the side effects of misoprostol include fever, chills, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Tocolytic drugs are used for multiple reasons preterm labor, cervical cerclage sometimes, uterine contractions or tachycystole associated with fetal heart rate abnormalities during labor, and external cephalic version. Calcium channel blockers um, are one such type of tocolytic drugs. Nifedipine is arguably the first line therapy for preterm labor. It has a low incidence of maternal and fetal side effects, but the side effects do include things like hypotension, nausea, flushing, dizziness and headache. Um, severely, it can cause maternal um, pulmonary edema or MI. It does not really have a significant effect on uteroplacental or fetal circulation. COX inhibitors include things like endomethacin, solindac, and ketorolac. Um, its mechanism of action is that it in inhibits COX and thereby it prevents prostaglandin synth synthesis, which limits contractions. Um, the side effects associated with this are nausea and heartburn, and it also causes a reversible abnormal platelet aggregation by decreasing thromboxane A2. But there's no need to assess platelet or coagulation function prior to neuraxial anesthesia in women who are taking this if there are no other risk factors. Um, COX inhibitors also cause a serious side effect of premature closure of the PDA. Um, and fetal oligohydramnios, which means if this is a drug that for uh, whatever reason needs to be used during labor um, or for, toco for tocolysis, uh, this may require increased monitoring of the fetus um, during the period in which it's being used. Uh, beta agonists. This is uh, the most commonly thought of tocolytic agent, and these would include things like terbutaline and ridodrine. How does it work? It's a selective beta-2 agonist, and it induces relaxation of uterine smooth muscle this way. How do you give it? Sub-Q. Rarely, you can also give it IV. The side effects can be pretty serious, um, and they include things like vasodilation, hypertension, pulmonary edema, which can even be life-threatening in some situations, hyperglycemia, and hypokalemia. Very, very rarely, it can um, elevate serum transaminase levels, it can cause ileus, cerebral vasospasm in patients with migraine and respiratory arrest, but that last thing really is um, primarily associated in patients who have known myasthenia gravis or suspected or undiagnosed potentially and who are given terbutaline or other beta agonists. So um, this may be a good uh, time for you to pause here and look over this chart and make sure that you know the contraindications for beta adrenergic agonists, the side effects in the fetal and neonatal side effects. But I will highlight a couple of the fetal stuff here. So um, giving uh, terbutaline or other beta agonists to mom can cause fetal tachycardia, hyperglycemia, um, myocardial and septal hypertrophy or even MI. And as the fetus makes transition into the neonatal period, um, the fetus can remain tachycardic, but then can get hypoglycemic and hypocalcemic and hyperbilirubinemic and hypotensive. And rarely um, they can have intraventricular hemorrhage. Magnesium sulfate. Um, it is also, uh, it's a tocolytic and it's also an anti-seizure medication. How does it work? It prevents a rise in intracellular free calcium levels. It decreases the sensitivity of the end plate to acetylcholine. It attenuates the release of the acetylcholine and it decreases excitability of muscle membranes. Um, the indications for use are preterm labor tocolysis and eclampsia prophylaxis. And also, the results of a multi-center RCT, a randomized control trial, 
of magnesium sulfate compared to placebo showed that antenatal magnesium reduces the incidence and severity of cerebral palsy after very preterm birth, which they defined as less than 30 weeks estimated gestational age. The side effects of magnesium are less severe um, in terms of its cardiovascular side effects than the beta agonists, but they include chest pain, palpitations, nausea, hypotension, blurry vision. Uh, more commonly, you'll, you'll see sedation. Um, rarely but severely, you may see pulmonary edema and also vasodilation or hypotension. Also, super therapeutic levels of magnesium can attenuate normal compensatory hemodynamic responses to hemorrhage. So this, coupled with um, the fact that magnesium can is a tocolytic or uterine relaxant and, and is also frequently associated with the use in women who are, have gone through um, long labors or induction of labors, um, can mean that a woman who's been exposed to, high, to magnesium is at risk for a, pulse, a postpartum hemorrhage. How, how is magnesium eliminated? by the kidneys. Um, and this is important because many times magnesium needs to be given for eclampsia prophylaxis and in some women who have preeclampsia with severe features, there can be compromise in renal function, which means that there needs to be closer monitoring in these women who have abnormal renal function. So magnesium um, has anesthetic interactions as well. It potentiates uh, neuromuscular blockers, both depolarizing and non-depolarizing muscle relaxants. So because of this, you should avoid absolutely defasciculating doses of non-depolarizing muscle relaxants. You should lower the dose of non-depolarizing muscle relaxants. Um, but you probably can use standard doses of succinylcholine, as we um, have described in clinical studies, this not really showing a significant effect. Magnesium can also reduce general anesthesia requirements. In one study, a serum mag level of 7 to 11 was associated with 20%. Um, reduction in volatile anesthetic requirement. <clears throat> it can impair coagulation since it acts as a calcium antagonist. So again, this characteristic plus the fact that it decreases uterine tone can place a woman at risk for postpartum hemorrhage. So here's another chart that you can pause and review and make sure you understand magnesium um, and its contraindications, its maternal uh, side effects, and its neonatal, fetal and neonatal side effects as well. So um, antepartum fetal assessments include things like routine ultrasonography. Now routine ultrasonography in the US, um, or in general, significantly improves the accuracy of dating. And it also can help detect abnormalities such as molar pregnancy, anencephaly, and multiple pregnancies. But the utility of routine second trimester ultrasound for all pregnant women is debatable. So let's move on to fetal heart rate monitoring. Um, fetal heart rate uh, baselines are defined as normal if they're between the 110 to 160 range. And how do you get a baseline? Um, it's basically the approximate mean fetal heart rate during a 10 minute segment and it lasts at least two minutes. Variability is normal when it's moderate, and moderate is defined as a range of uh, 6 to 25 beats per minute. In general, variability is defined as fluctuations in the baseline of more than two cycles per minute. Um, the, uh, an absent variability is basically an amplitude range that is undetectable. It's minimal if it's uh, detectable but less than 5, moderate we talked about, and it's marked if the range is greater than 25. Accelerations are defined as an abrupt increase in fetal heart rate above baseline. And at or after 20 weeks uh, or 32 weeks of gestational age, um, greater than 15 for greater than 15 seconds is desirable, but it must last less than two minutes. If they're younger than 32 weeks estimated gestational age, greater than 10 for greater than 10 seconds, but less than two minutes is desirable. If the duration is longer than 10 minutes, then this can be thought of as a change in baseline. Decelerations, now they, these are abnormal almost universally and they range in severity from early variable to late. Um, earlier, early decelerations are associated with uterine contractions. The onset and the nadir and the recovery of an early deceleration coincides with the beginning, peak, and end of a uterine contraction. Variable decelerations are abrupt decreases um, to 15 beats per minute below baseline and they last for greater than 15 seconds but less than two minutes. Late decelerations are gradual decreases um, and re 
uh, result in a gradual decrease in return to baseline and fetal heart rate that is associated with uterine contraction. Um, as opposed to an early deceleration, a late deceleration has a nadir that occurs after the peak of the contraction. A prolonged deceleration lasts more than two minutes, but less than 10 minutes. And again, if the duration is longer than 10 minutes, it can be potentially thought of as a change in baseline. A recurrent deceleration is the presence of a deceleration with more than 50% of uterine contractions in any 20 minute period. This is uh, a normal reactive heart, fetal heart rate tracing. So you can see the baseline is between 110 and 160. There is moderate variability defined as five, six to 25 beats per minute from peak to trough. And there are two or more accelerations which are defined as an increase in fetal heart rate of greater than or equal to 15 beats per minute above baseline, lasting at least 15 seconds in a 20 minute period. Here is an at-risk tracing. The baseline is normal, but there is minimal variability, no accelerations, and decelerations are present, which are late and repetitive. Here is no variability and minimal variability. Here is moderate and marked variability. Now, Several drugs have effects on fetal heart rate. Um, atropine, epinephrine, and beta agonists can cause fetal tachycardia. Um, multiple things can cause fetal bradycardia. Antithyroid medications, beta antagonists, um, methargen, oxytocin, and intrathecal or epidural analgesia can also cause fetal bradycardia, although this is mostly transient in nature. Um, there are multiple mechanisms at play here. There's a decrease in SVR associated with these techniques, which can decrease uterine blood flow. And acutely with rapid analgesia, that can happen during initial insertion and activation of epidural analgesia, uh, there can be a rapid withdrawal of circulating catecholamines. And this withdrawal can potentially lead to increased uterine tone and activity, otherwise known as tachycystole which is defined as six contractions in a 10 minute period. Systemic opioids can also cause a sinusoidal fetal heart rate pattern, and also they can cause diminished variability on the monitor. Several other agents um, and anesthetics also cause diminished variability, including general anesthesia, hypnotics, insulin, magnesium, beta blockers, atropine, and steroids. There are now three categories of fetal heart rate tracings that are now recommended by the National Institutes of Health. Category one is normal, category two is indeterminate, and category three is abnormal. An NST is performed when formal documentation of the fetal condition is necessary after 28 weeks of gestation. Otherwise, before this, the fetal autonomic nervous system is too immature to provide any useful information. It is a 20 to 40 minute non-invasive recording of the fetal heart rate. It is most useful in cases of uteral placental insufficiency. A reactive NST is regarded as evidence of fetal health, but a non-reactive NST is controversial. It must consider gestational age, underlying clinical circumstances, and results of previous fetal heart rate tracings. Only 65% of fetuses have a reactive NST by 28 weeks of estimated gestational age, whereas 95% do by 32 weeks. Once a reactive NST is documented in a given pregnancy, the NST should remain reactive throughout the pregnancy. A non-reactive NST at term is associated with poor perinatal out outcomes in 20% of cases. A biophysical profile, or a BPP, is an ultrasonographic scoring system performed over a 30 to 40 minute period. Variables include gross fetal body movements, fetal tone, amniotic fluid volume, fetal breathing movements, and the NST. There are scores of zero to two of each of these components, but none of them are equally predictive for adverse pregnancy outcomes. Here are the components of a BPP. You can pause here to see each component in their normal and abnormal definitions. So these are scores associated with the BPP. Eight to 10 is normal, and you can see that Im imminent delivery of the infant may be, necessar may be necessary for scores of four or below. The oxytocin challenge test is an older test of uteroplacental function, 
whereby you give intravenous oxytocin or stimulate the nipples and assess the fetal heart rate with uterine contractions. A minimum of three contractions of, mi of minimal to moderate strength in 10 minutes is required for a complete test. A negative OCT, um, in which you see no decelerations with contractions, is reassuring. A uh, positive OCT is when you have repetitive late or variable, uh, severe variable decelerations, which suggests fetal suffering. A positive OCT is associated with adverse perinatal outcome in 35 to 40% of patients. Let's move on to anesthetic techniques and risks. Since this is an advanced lecture, I assume you know the basics of these techniques, so I'll just highlight a few fun facts. Uh, fun fact. So for um, continuous epidural, you should be very familiar with the advantages associated with this, but there are a few disadvantages. So it is a bit of a slower onset of analgesia. Uh, larger drug dose requirements are, um, are needed with continuous epidurals compared to spinal techniques. And because of this, there may be a greater risk for maternal systemic toxicity and a greater risk for fetal drug exposure. Continuous spinal epidurals, or CSEs, um, have multiple advantages, including that lower doses of local anesthetics are required. It's rapid onset, it's rapid onset of sacral analgesia. You can extend it for cesarean, just like with the epidural. Um, if you used opioids alone for the spinal technique, you get complete analgesia with that. And also there's a decreased incidence of failed epidural analgesia associated with spinal epidural uh, CSEs. However, there are some disadvantages, including that you may delay the verification of a correctly placed and functioning epidural catheter. Uh, people who get CSEs, especially with high doses of opioids in the spinal component, can have higher um, incidence of pruritus. And poss possibly um, there may be a higher association of fetal bradycardia with this technique compared to continuous epidural. Again, possibly related to that rapid withdrawal or rapid analgesia and rapid withdrawal of circulating catecholamines. Continuous spinals, um, now there are some advantages. It's very reliable. You can extend it for cesarean, lower doses of local anesthetic and opioid very fast. But again, there are some disadvantages. In order to introduce a spinal catheter, you may need to uh, cause a large dural puncture, which can increase a woman's risk for a post dural puncture headache. There are also possibilities of overdoses and total spinal anesthesia if the spinal catheter is inadvertently used as an epidural catheter. Um, continuous caudal is a technique that really has not been used um, in modern times, but, but there are some advantages, uh, including that you may be able to access the neuraxial canal through um, by avoiding the lumbar interspaces, which can be useful in patients, let's say, who have had previous lumbar spine surgery and whose lumbar techniques may be challenging. On the other hand, in order to use a continuous caudal, it requires lots of medication, large volumes and doses of drugs. It may be more technically difficult and can possibly um, cause a higher risk for infection compared to epidural techniques. And there is a potential risk for inadvertent fetal injection during this type of anesthesia. Single shot spinals are fast, technically simple, um, immediate sacral analgesia and low doses are used. But the obvious disadvantage is that there is a limited um, duration of analgesia associated with this technique. There are alternative analgesic techniques for labor as well. One of them is the paracervical walk, which is most helpful for the first stage of labor. Here was a study that randomized 122 Paris women to bupivacaine paracervical blocks or single shot spinals with bupivacaine plus fentanyl. They found that a single shot spinal was superior than um, was superior to a paracervical block, although it is notable that the paracervical block group resulted in uh, VRS pain scores of three or lower in 43% of patients. And over half of the women in this group indicated that they would be happy to receive this analgesia again. Both groups had zero cases of fetal bradycardia. There was also another study that showed no differences in newborn infant behavior or neurologic function between groups of women who received paracervical block compared to women who received no analgesia. Here's the technique. The hand and the fingers are positioned so that no undue pressure is applied at the vaginal fornix by the fingers or the needle gauge. The needle is inserted to a very shallow depth. There are some risks. Maternal risks include vasovagal syncope, laceration of vaginal mucosa, systemic local anesthetic toxicity, or LAST, parametrial hematomas, postpartum neuropathies, and paracervical retropsoal or subgluteal abscesses in the postpartum period. There are fetal risks. 
um, there is a risk for direct injection into the fetal scalp, which can cause last. This is more likely to occur if you do this technique in advanced dilation of more than eight centimeters. And for this risk, it's very important that um, with the technique, you use the most dilute local anesthetics that are as possible. Bradycardia is probably the most common fetal adverse effect. Part of this is reflex by manipulation of the fetal head, and part of it is reduced uteroplacental placental or fetal placental perfusion that can occur due to increased uterine activity or by direct vasoconstriction um, caused by the local anesthetics. So therefore, this technique is contraindicated in cases of known uteroplacental placental insufficiency or pre-existing fetal compromise. Another alternative is the lumbar sympathetic block, also mostly only helpful in the first stage of labor. It interrupts transmission of pain from the cervix and the lower uterine segment, and it may be associated with accelerated labor. So in a study of 39 healthy nulliparous women at term, the lumbar sympathetic block uh, group had a more rapid rate of cervical dilation change during the first two hours of analgesia and a shorter of second stage of labor, um, a shorter second stage of labor, but no difference in the rate of cervical change from four to eight centimeters, four to ten centimeters. Hunter and his group also observed that in 14 of 19 patients, lumbar sympathetic blocks converted an abnormal uterine contractile pattern to a normal pattern. There are complications with this block. You can get modest hypotension, increased uterine activity, LAST, total spinal, retroperitoneal hematomas, Horner syndrome, and you can even get a postural puncture headache, just like with interaxial. Fetal complications are unlikely, however, with this technique. So lumbar sympathetic block may be an alternative option when patients have a history of previous back surgery that precludes successful epidural analgesia. And it may also be an option for women who have contraindications to neuraxial techniques. It also minimizes motor block. However, this can be achieved with modern epidural analgesic techniques that utilize low concentrations of local anesthetics with opioids. It is a more painful procedure, and these days it really offers little unique advantages compared to epidural analgesic techniques on a routine basis. Um, sadly, few anesthesiologists probably have maintained the skills in this technique, and perhaps um, the use of thoracic paravertebral blocks may have some promise to be used more often in parturients for whom neuraxial block is indicated. A pudendal nerve block is most helpful for pain associated with the second stage of labor. It will block somatic pain, but not the visceral pain of contractions and cervical dilation. It is most useful in cases of normal vaginal delivery, um, outlet forceps delivery, but not mid forceps delivery, um, postpartum examinations, um, and repair of the upper vaginal cervix or manual exploration, exploration of the uterine cavity is probably not uh, effective with this, is not affected very much with this technique. So here's a technique the needle passes through the sacrospinous ligament. Um, to reach the pudendal nerve. And again, local anesthetics should be dilute um, over, uh, due to the rapid uh, maternal absorption of local anesthetic, as well as significant amounts of fetal local anesthetic absorption that can occur with this type of block. For pudendal nerve blocks and paracervical blocks, the obstetrician has to make several blind needle punctures within the vagina. So there is a significant risk for physician needle stick injury with performance of these procedures. Um, there are several maternal complications that can be associated with this block. There's laceration of the vaginal mucosa, last vaginal, ischiorectal, or retroperitoneal hematomas, and retropso retropsoal or subgluteal abscesses can occur. There are also fetal complications that can happen by direct trauma or direct injection of the local anesthetic. Let's talk about postpartum neurologic complications. You can divide these into two categories, basically. Um, obstetric birth trauma or intrinsic birth injuries, nerve injuries, which are peri basically peripheral nerve palsies, and anesthetic-related nerve injuries. Um, obstetric birth trauma or peripheral nerve palsies. Now again, these are not directly related to having an epidural placed, but we are frequently consulted on these due to the fact that many women who do get the epidural end up having these problems because the epidural keeps them comfortable and um, doesn't allow them to feel any, any type of pain that may be associated with stretch injuries. 
What's the incidence of these? Approximately 1%. And if it were to happen, it can last about two to three months, which is important to know when counseling these patients on um, how long the symptoms may last until resolution or improvement. Um, the factors that are associated with obstetric nerve palsies include these things, nulliparity or first delivery, prolonged second stage of labor, so long periods in, in, in funny positions, fetal macrosomia, big babies, and hip hyperflexion or funny positions in general. The palsies can be thought of as these in, um, in general, lumbosacral trunk, obturator nerve, femoral nerve, lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, sciatic nerve, and peroneal nerve. Um, an injury to the lumbosacral trunk will manifest as a foot drop, and the biggest risk factors for this are macrosomia and prolonged labor, so that you can see big heads in the pelvic outlet um, area for long periods of time can compress the nerve and cause injury. Obturator nerve injuries will present as weaknesses or motor, area, uh, motor deficiencies in hip adduction and internal rotation. There's also a sensory component in the upper inner thigh. Uh, big, biggest risk factors for this, again, cephalopelvic disproportion or big babies, again, and long labors where um, compression can occur for a long period of time. Lateral femoral cutaneous nerve injuries are the most common postpartum peripheral nerve palsies. This is only sensory in nature. There's absolutely no motor component associated with this. And it uh, affects the sensory um, area or pins and needles sensation or numbness in the anterior lateral thigh, sometimes thought of like the gene, uh, gene pocket distribution of numbness. This happens as a result of entrapment as it passes around the anterior superior iliac, iliac spine beneath or through the inguinal ligament. Um, big risk factors for this, obesity. So this injury can actually occur um, independent of a pregnancy and just big people in general who wear tight pants can have this type of injury. Um, large intra-abdominal masses such as pregnancy, retractors, and edema. So edema which can occur in basically almost any woman who receives um, oxytocin in the postpartum period, water retention may occur and exacerbate um, swelling around this nerve. A femoral nerve injury is the next most common peripheral nerve palsy. Um, in the postpartum period. Um, in this, it will manifest as a woman who can walk on a, on a flat surface, but she cannot climb stairs. If you were to do uh, patellar reflexes, they would be diminished or even absent. Um, bilateral femoral nerve palsies have certainly been described as well. The iliopsoas is spared, so if you were to test hip flexion, you may still get a little bit of hip flexion. Now, the biggest culprits here are labor positioning, meaning hyperflexion at the pushing stage of labor, and excessive lithotomy positions. So a position such as this should really not be um, pursued in the second stage of labor as much as possible or minimized um, and relieved as often as possible during the second stage. Sciatic nerve injuries have sensory and motor components. Uh, sensory deficits are below the knee, but it spares the medial side of the knee. The motor component is also below the knee. Um, if you were to test gluteal function, you would see um, that this was still intact because there is an intact posterior cutaneous nerve, um, which will differentiate this nerve injury from a lumbosacral trunk injury, which sometimes um, can be confusing in its clinical presentation. The culprit here is uh, the hip wedge. So this is why it's important when placing a hip wedge not to place it under the soft part of the pelvis, but rather to try to target the bony part of the pelvis as much as possible. Peroneal nerve injuries present as a sensory deficit in the anterior lateral calf and foot dorsum. Uh, the motor injury uh, is that it's a profound foot drop, worse than the lumbosacral trunk. There's a steppage gait, there's weak ankle eversion, but preserved plantar, plantar inversion or flexion. Now, um, multiple causes are associated with this. So prolonged squatting, which can sometimes happen in women who are attempting natural or unmedicated labor. So it's important because this injury can even occur in a woman who has never received an, a neuraxial anesthetic. Um, hip flexion, or sorry, knee flexion, compression of the lateral knee, or pro prolonged lithotomy, which are very common positions um, during labor and delivery, either in the OR or in a labor and delivery room. So in summary, um, to minimize peripheral nerve compression, you can safeguard against this by watching patient positioning, putting the hip wedge under the bony pelvis rather than the buttock, 
using low dose local anesthetic and opioid combinations for labor is extremely important because this will minimize numbness and allow for maximum mobility of, um, of uh, the women during labor. Um, counseling your women to pursue regular position changes during labor and delivery is also important. And also educating caregivers that numbness or weakness may be signs of nerve compression. Um, and then uh, counseling them to basically immediately change positions for the patient um, as well. So now the second category, which is stuff we are responsible for, anesthesia-related nerve injury. You can basically think of these as traumatic, space-occupying lesions, or chemical injuries. Trauma. Now, where at the end of the spinal cord, traditionally we're taught that it's L1 or 2, but um, in many patients it can, be as, uh, it can be L2 to 3, and in some patients even lower than that. What we also know is that we are not very good at accurately um, identifying the inner spaces. We are only correct at identifying inner spaces about 29% of the time. So this was a study done of 200 um, anesthetists in Oxford in the UK. Um, in which they asked the anesthetists to try to examine, um, to palpate spaces and to mark off where they thought the spaces were. And then they sent those patients to the MRI to see just how um, accurate the estimations were and also to see where the conus medullaris terminated in, the, in those cases. You can see that only uh, about 30% of the time where we actually spot on where we thought we were. And the vast majority of the time, over 50% of the time, we were wrong and in the wrong direction, meaning we thought what we thought was a particular in a space, say L, uh, L2 to 3, was actually L1 to 2. And in 19% of the patients that went through the study, the conus actually terminated well below L1. So what does this all mean? Um, it means that you should never knowingly go at levels higher than you expect the conus to terminate and should always probably attempt subarachnoid injections at the lowest levels possible. If you were to get conus um, during your techniques, your patient would have severe lancinating pain upon simple introduction of the needle, and you should stop right away. Do not inject on that. Here was a case where um, injection was attempted um, after the patient did have some symptoms and pain um, in the leg. Um, but injection um, occurred regardless, and this did result in um, this searing or hematoma that you see within the conus at the level of the body of T12, uh, which was the same side as the pain on insertion for the patient and subsequent leg symptoms. So there are several risk factors for hematoma and abscess. For hematoma, risk factors include difficult or traumatic placement, coagulopathy or therapeutic anticoagulation, spinal deformities, and spinal tumors. Um, your patient, if you're examining them, may have a backache and um, also focal neurologic signs. And the backache may be reproducible, meaning when you push on it, it can get worse and or exacerbate the neurologic signs. Outcomes depend on the duration of the symptoms before surgical decompression. And really, um, compressive intraspinal lesions require urgent lam laminectomy within six to 12 hours of the onset of symptoms. Abscesses are pretty rare, um, and they can occur uh, less acutely than a hematoma may occur. So these can occur usually between four and 10 days after neuraxial is attempted. Your signs may include fever, white count, severe back aches, and also focal neurologic signs, just like a hematoma. How do you treat this? Same, you need a laminectomy, you need to decompress. And uh, especially if they're associated focal neurologic signs that, that may become permanent if otherwise. And also intravenous antibiotics for um, a certain period of time. Two to four weeks of antibiotics. So um, high enough local anesthetic concentrations can be toxic to nerves. And this can manifest as transient neurologic syndrome or cauda equina syndrome. Um, inadvertent Epidural injections occur for multiple things. They've been described for thiopental, um, potassium chloride, peraldehyde. In Britain, there was a famous case of pain, painful permanent quadriplegia associated with peraldehyde injection in the epidural space. And so um, it's very important to may, uh, realize that you're responsible, you and you alone are responsible for making sure that no one injects into your catheter except you um, or your team member. Now. There is also considerations for the influence of anesthetic technique on labor itself. And what we're talking about here are its influence potentially on cesarean delivery rates, instrumental vaginal delivery rates, and the duration of labor. 
The most recent meta-analysis on the topic of epidural versus non-epidural or no analgesia in labor on the outcome of cesareans showed no difference uh, between groups in the rate of cesarean delivery out of 27 trials. The risk ratio uh, for cesarean delivery in women randomly assigned to receive neuraxial analgesia compared to those with non-epidural or no analgesia during labor was 1.1. Maternal fetal indicators or factors and OB management, um, not the use of neuraxial anesthesia, are probably the most important determinants of the cesarean delivery rate. Now what about its influence on instrumental vaginal delivery rate? It's controversial on whether or not there is a cause and effect relationship. There have been multiple observational studies that link labor analgesia and the risk for instrumental vaginal delivery. Um, what we also know is that dense neuroblockade or a motor block and complete analgesia in the second stage probably increase the rate of instrumental vaginal delivery. Therefore, this is another reason why it's incredibly important to use dilute local anesthetics with opioids during labor because this is less likely to adversely affect the progress of labor. How about uh, the duration of labor? Um, here was a recent meta-analysis done on the influence of epidural analgesia on the duration of labor. The findings showed that certainly the second stage is increased, but only by 13 to 14 minutes, which is really clinically insignificant. Although statistically significant in these studies, clinically insignificant. That's all I've got. Please feel free to send me any questions to this email address. Um, good luck on your exam. I hope you get all the OB questions right. And uh, remember the incredible honor and privilege that we have in caring for these women and their families during such an important time in their lives. Good luck.